So, hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Let's start our uh, eighth uh, lecture. Uh, before we start our lecture, I, I will show you some uh, videos from our sponsors, okay? So, first of all, uh, from Professor Paulo Gamba. Good morning, my name is Paolo Gamba and I am the president for the year 2020 of the Geoscience Remote Sensing Society. Okay, so first of all, what is a scientific society? What is GRSS? So a scientific society is a group of, of scientists, researchers and practitioners with common interest and common framework for building a community. In our specific case, we are uh, people who are dealing with theory, concept and techniques of science and engineering as they apply to remote sensing of the earth, ocean, atmosphere and space, as well as the processing, interpretation and dissemination of this information. So what are the activities of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society? Well, we have a number of publications, we support conferences, we have professional activities we have a number of information service and technical activities and education activities as well. We are a global community, which means that we are arranged around large number of uh, groups of people that we call chapters all around the world. We have currently more than 90 uh, chapters all around the world. As a result, the GRSS disseminates premium science by means of its three main journals, which are the Transactional Geoscience and Remote Sensing, the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Letters, the IEEE Journal of Selected Topics in Applied Earth Observation and Remote Sensing, but we have also a magazine, which, by the way, has a very, very important uh, uh, role. We also provide opportunities to, for the different communities, like, for instance, the community working on image analysis and data fusion. We have also, uh, we also sponsor community-driven events, like uh, the very um, successful Earth Vision workshop, but also the SpaceNet Challenge Data Challenges here, which is organized by SpaceNet. We support also community developed tools like the DESE website, which is data and algorithm standard evaluation website, and also activities related to RFI observations. So we also facilitate and connect. We have a number of activities at the, in, a, in our main conference. We have the so-called TIE events, but we also organize different events related to uh, connection with uh, companies, industries. We have a number of activities like for young professionals, for women in uh, engineering and in geoscience and remote sensing. And we share our knowledge on hot topics by means of distinguished lectures, lecturers and industry speakers. We have also a number of uh, uh, educational activities. This is one of them. This is basically let's say one of the many uh, different small uh, educational videos for uh, kids that we have in different languages, but we have also, in addition to that, a number of webinars, which are also for people who are not kids, about uh, remote sensing in different languages as well. Uh, we offer continuing education by means of webinars, which is especially uh, important and useful in this situation where we are not able anymore to move around the world as we were in the past. So we can support continuing education of students and young professionals through conferences, journals, our magazine, webinars and so on. We can promote capabilities of the different communities, algorithms, data set by means of the data fusion context, by means of dedicated events at our conferences, by means of the industrial distinguished lecture or industrial speakers. We help connect companies and young motivated people by means of the young professional event, by means of student grants, by means of the Thai forum. And we make the different community of earth observation practitioner and researcher be aware of their and your topics of interest. So GRSS is actually a community of communities where we could 
together share and promote ideas, systems and data set. We can meet with other communities and gain from their perspective and we can build different collaboration to learn more from each other and to come together in conferences. Thank you very much and I hope you will enjoy this uh, summer school and all the interesting topic and talks that you are going to listen during these days. So, thank you, Paolo. So let's see some uh, words from uh, Sherry Harris from ISPRS. Hi, everyone. My name is Cheryl Rose Reyes, and I currently serve as the president of the International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing Student Consortium. I am very happy to welcome you all to the sixth edition of the IEEE GRSS Young Professionals and ISPRS Student Consortium Summer School this year. To start this event, I would like to present a bit about the ISPRS Student Consortium. We are the official representation of the youth to ISPRS. We link students, young researchers, and professionals worldwide interested in photogrammetry, remote sensing, and spatial information science to promote their scientific and professional developments. We advocate imaging and geospatial science for informed, scientifically valid, and technologically sound observations of Earth conditions and trends that lead to improved and effective decision making. The consortium is also accepting registrations for individual membership. Please scan the QR code in this slide if you are interested to join us. I work together with members of the board of directors from all across the globe. Charles from Uganda is our vice president. Charmaine, who is currently in Ireland, is in charge of our newsletter. Mustafa, our social media administrator, is from Turkey. And finally, Sona from Azerbaijan is our web administrator. One of the major events that we host and coordinate every year are the summer schools. In 2019, the summer schools were in Uganda, Poland, South Korea, and Brazil. These summer schools provide international learning opportunities for students and young professionals at a minimum cost. This year, we scheduled three summer schools, but due to the COVID-19 situation, Two of them were postponed, and we are sincerely thankful to the organizers of this summer school for making this an incredible virtual event. This is the first ISPRS Student Consortium Summer School that will be hosted online, and as you can see, we have an amazing lineup of speakers who will deliver lectures on remote sensing and machine learning. The consortium currently hosts the virtual rooms and the webinar series to provide our community with more opportunities to learn and interact with experts in our scientific community. The webinar series was conceptualized in 2018 and we have organized webinars on Google Earth Engine, computer vision, and machine learning. The virtual rooms is an initiative to keep the members of the consortium connected during this challenging time and to help them navigate our changing lifestyles. All the resources for the webinar series and the virtual rooms are available on our website and our YouTube channel. We also publish an official newsletter called Spectrum, which covers the broad applications of remote sensing, photogrammetry, and spatial information science, and welcomes contributors from diverse backgrounds and disciplines. We publish four issues a year, and our most recent issue is related to the current pandemic and the significance of geospatial information in tackling the impacts of this global health crisis to our society. The ISPRS Congress is one of the biggest gatherings in our scientific community, which is held every four years. The Congress hosted a virtual event for all papers submitted this year and postponed the in-person meeting for 2021. During the Congress, the consortium will be hosting a three-day youth forum, which will feature the following activities. Speed dating, technical sessions, a special session on women in remote sensing, photogrammetry, and spatial information science, a panel discussion, the general assembly for our members, a student night, another summer school, and we'll co-organize a mapping party. 
The consortium would also like to invite you to nominate papers for the Excellence Award to be given during this event. Please scan the QR code for eligibility and nominations. Also, please visit the ISPRS Congress official website for updates. Finally, I would like to invite you all to join our communities on Facebook, Twitter, and to visit our website for all the information shared in this presentation. And again, I would like to invite you all to register as an individual member by scanning the QR code on the right. This is the end of my presentation, and I wish you all a meaningful summer school. Thank you very much. So thank you, Ariel. Uh, and now let's start our session. I would like to invite our colleagues. Uh, first of all, Professor Philippe Maillard. It's my colleague here uh, at uh, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, and also our student invited, Laura Helena from PUC Rio. So thank you for accepting to share with me this this, this nice uh, task of conducting the the lecture, the session. Okay. So Philip, uh, could you please introduce our uh, speaker, please? Okay, yeah. Hello, Jefferson. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, we're going to start our session with Mauro Dallamura. Mauro was, if I can, uh, Mauro received a, a, a bachelor and a master's degree in telecommunication engineering at the University of Trento in Italy. He then uh, pursued a PhD in information communication, communication technologies at the same university, but also it uh, was a joint PhD at the electrical and computer, computer engineering from the University of Iceland. Okay, his, his talk will be about uh, image fusion or pan, pan sharpening, as it's my rick rightfully called. Um, so he will do a kind of overall uh, uh, perspective on the pan sharpening issue. And then afterwards, um, we'll have uh, a 30 minute discussion. So uh, Mauro should take you know, up to about an hour, I think, for his presentation. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a period of questions and comments. So welcome, Mauro. It's a good, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we're very honored to, to have you for this presentation. And without anything less and anything more, I, I will pass you the word so you can start your presentation. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, Felipe, for the nice introduction. And I would like to thank all the organizing committee, Jefferson, Veraldo, and all uh, the other colleagues for this uh, invitation. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be part of this uh, summer school. And uh, so it's a pity that is not uh, that we we could not do it uh, like live in, in person. But like anyway, it's uh, it's good to gather together uh, even remotely. So I'm going to share. So my my screen is shared. I'm going to put it in a full screen. So now I think you should see my slides in a full screen. And then I so if it doesn't work, just uh, shout and uh, I will try to you know uh, get back on that. So um, uh, the, the talk that I am going to give is about pan sharpening. And the idea is to uh, provide an overview on the topic and, uh, and some perspectives. So let's uh, start with, uh, with the presentation. And uh, like pan sharpening deals actually with very high spatial resolution optical images. So here you see an example. Uh, where we have images acquired by satellites uh, that have a very uh, fine uh, resolution and we, we see uh, very precisely like small uh, spatial details. And for example, here you have an, a comparison between images acquired with 
let's say, a spatial resolution of about 30 centimeters. So that is uh, what, what we call a ground sampling interval or ground sampling uh, distance. So that basically uh, the footprint of a pixel projected on, on the ground. So that is about 30 centimeters squared. And here for comparison, you see uh, an example of an image acquired with a coarser spatial resolution that is about 70 centimeters. And so it is easy to see uh, that higher quality in terms of uh, the rendering of the spatial details is provided by having uh, images of higher spatial resolution. And if we have a look to the panorama of the, uh, the different satellites that are present and orbiting around the, the Earth uh, and acquiring images of uh, very high spatial resolution, uh, we, we can see that, that we have uh, really a lot of them. So, for example, here you see some examples of uh, very high resolution satellites uh, that are uh, coming from the Earth Space Agency and uh, uh, like data are distributed by Airbus. And here you see uh, some constellations that are uh, owned and, uh, and handled by Maxar and they all provide uh, images of very high spatial resolution. So let's see now uh, what we can do with this kind of uh, very high spatial resolution images. So as you know, uh, there was uh, like a, a very sad event in Beirut, Lebanon in August 2020, where like there was a big explosion in, in the harbor and uh, more than uh, 100 people died and there were several uh, thousands uh, wounded. And here you can see an image acquired by a very high spatial resolution satellite, which is Worldview. Uh, this is a satellite from Maxar, the Maxar group. And here you, you can see an image acquired before the event. And now you see an image acquired after the event. And we can see that by having at our disposal images of very fine spatial resolution, it is possible to give uh, in, a, in a short amount of time an assessment on the damage that was uh, that was that occurred that was caused by this uh, by this event and here you have another example so here we have another part of uh, on the arbor uh, so the image was acquired before the event and here we can see uh, what happened uh, afterwards so uh, as you can see this kind of imagery is uh, is fundamental is uh, really pivotal for uh, gaining some information in a quick way and uh, uh, allowing to assess uh, what, what what are the you know the the consequences of uh, like a natural hazard or like to finally mo monitor uh, some some resources or like uh, you know some human activities and so on so having at our disposal images that are like that have fine resolution is really important. So if we want to acquire such, such images or like uh, in order to uh, perform some fine analysis on, on those scene, uh, we can like look on catalogs and like order them or like uh, looking into archives and so on. And uh, by doing this, uh, it is possible to see that we have different products that are offered. So those very high spatial resolution satellites acquire uh, images that are uh, of different characteristics in terms of spatial and spectral resolution. And by the data that, that are offered uh, by the data providers, we can see that there are some uh, products that are related to punch sharpening. So this is that was an example from Maxer, and then this is another example from from the company Airbus that is uh, providing images of very high resolution from satellites, uh, for example, um, that were launched by CNES, the French Space Agency. 
And so we can see that, for example, this, this is uh, the case for the satellite Pleiades. And we can see that we have different products, as I mentioned. So the, the basic row acquisition is a panchromatic image of like uh, spatial resolution, in this case of 50 centimeters, and a multispectral uh, acquisition, a multispectral image, having a spatial resolution of about two meters. And this provides for uh, different spectral bands. So uh, a blue, green, red, and a band in the near infrared. So this is kind of a raw uh, acquisition, like uh, images that, that were acquired and not processed by, or like at least uh, uh, with some pre-processing, but they are offered to, to users. And then it is possible also to have some uh, other products and those products are, for example, point sharpened images. And, and we can see that we have different uh, kind of uh, those products like uh, using uh, four bands or three bands for having like a natural color image and so on. So it is possible uh, to, uh, to underline in this case that uh, like images, again, as I mentioned, like they are coming in two different formats in general. And it is possible uh, to acquire or like to generate images of higher spatial resolution uh, in terms of, with respect to the multispectral acquisition. And those are uh, the so-called point sharpening uh, products. So if we now focus uh, on like point sharpening, so what is point sharpening? So as I mentioned, like those satellites that I presented before, acquire usually a bundle of two images, uh, one image acquired by a panchromatic sensor that will look, for example, like this, this example that you, you see here. So this is a monochrome image, which is actually uh, acquired by a large band uh, sensor, uh, showing very fine details that are present in the image. So the spatial resolution of this image is pretty, is higher than like the companion uh, multispectral image. So these multispectral images acquired by another sensor that is, uh, that is keeping the same platform. So those, th those two sensors are mounted on, on the same platform. And this multispectral image shows uh, some spectral diversity because we have different spectral bands. And we can see that the the spatial resolution is lower with respect to this image here. So in, uh, in like in a nutshell, what is for sharpening is uh, like the, the process of fusing a panchromatic image uh, and a multispectral image in order to have an image uh, which has the bands, the spectral information coming from the multispectral image, but the details coming from the panchromatic image. So again, like we have those two raw images and we would like to fuse them in order to obtain this point sharpened image. So the uh, presentation that, that I'm going to give uh, is based on uh, a collaborative effort uh, of like uh, providing a unifying framework uh, where we can, we can cast uh, several point sharpening algorithms that have been proposed over some decades. And the, the sources of, uh, of this presentation are contained uh, in like two main publications. So the first one was uh, published in 2015, and so you have the reference here. And there's a new one that just got recently accepted in uh, IEEE College of Science and Remote Sensing magazine that is giving some updated uh, information on, uh, on such a survey. So if we uh, start to get more in, uh, in depth in, uh, in what concerns the point sharpening algorithms that are present in the literature, so point sharpening is a very active uh, area of, of research in a remote sensing. So like if you go on IEEE Explore, for example, and you search for point sharpening, you will, you will see like many hits uh, coming out in terms of conferences and journal papers. 
And if you have a look to those papers, you will see that like there are like a plethora, there are like uh, really uh, several methods and several different algorithms that have been proposed. Because as I mentioned, this area of research uh, started like in more than 30 years ago. So there are several decades in which uh, researchers and practitioners have proposed different techniques for performing such a sharpening of the multispectral image using the panchromatic information. So the idea of this presentation is to uh, provide uh, like for what we call classical algorithms. So the, the main algorithms that uh, can be considered as kind of baselines uh, to provide a unifying framework where we can uh, we can define them and and that will ease uh, the, their presentation and also their comparison. So let's now start uh, to uh, to give some more details on uh, on these band sharpening techniques. So as I mentioned before, like uh, the goal of band sharpening will be to fuse those two images in order to get a higher spatial resolution multispectral image using guiding guided by uh, the details that are present in the panchromatic image and this is actually uh, a problem which is ill posed because uh, there are several different solutions that we can provide here that would satisfy somehow uh, like the problem of using a panchromatic and a multispectral image so the the problems uh, the, the main limitations or the, the issues that we need to face in order to generate such uh, like synthetic image of high spatial and spectral resolution are related to the fact that the spatial details uh, that are present in the panchromatic image, they are not visible in the multispectral. And what we see in the, in the panchromatic image um, doesn't show like any link to the spectral bands providing this spectral diversity that here is uh, is shown uh, is represented by different colors that we see in the multispectral image so basically like by looking at this gray level here it's difficult to guess that that was uh, due to uh, these kind of materials with a given reflectance that will provide a radiance uh, that in, uh, in the visible domain looks like this. So we might have ambiguities in that. So this is not an issue for the, those large areas, but can be an issue for the small details that are resolved here, so we can see them, but we cannot see them in the multispectral image. So uh, just to fix uh, some, some main concepts that will be uh, useful for in the following, so when, uh, as we are dealing with images of different spatial resolution, as you can see here, um, what is usually done is to model this reduced resolution that we can see uh, that shows, uh, that is shown by the multispectral image with respect to the panchromatic image, can, could be modeled by uh, a convolution uh, of the, let's say, unknown uh, multispectral image of higher resolution with a given kernel, with a given mask. And that mask can be associated to the impulse response of the multispectral image, which is usually called the uh, point spread function. So basically, uh, in this setting, we could consider the panchromatic as being kind of a perfect image in terms of uh, uh, what we say, what we um, associate uh, with the, 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 um, the possibility to resolve uh, in a good way spatial details and uh, the multispectral image uh, like conversely if we have a look if we perform the same the same uh, in terms of analogy if we do the same um, if we present the relationship between the panchromatic and the multispectral from the spatial from the spectral domain, uh, the multispectral will, as I mentioned, will show uh, this uh, spectral diversity due to the fact that we have um, we we sample the spectral domain of light in different intervals, 
and those will not be the, the case for the panchromatic because there will be an integration over a larger domain in the spectral domain. So if we now uh, go uh, on and uh, we we can now present uh, what are the the main approaches that have been proposed in uh, such uh, uh, like a huge amount of works that have been uh, that have, have appeared uh, since uh, the early 90s so uh, the there is actually a a main uh, model that we can that we can define and we will see that this model here that I'm going to present it in a while uh, will be um, like a kind of a general model that we can that we can find uh, the, that we can uh, find it in uh, in different uh, in different algorithms under let's say uh, slight variations and that was one of the main goals of the, those works that I mentioned, like try to find a unifying uh, framework. So here, uh, in terms of notation that will be used in the following, um, we have, we denote by M uh, hat the result of the punch sharpening for a given band. So that would be uh, the uh, one of the band of the synthetic image showing a high, about high spatial and high spectral resolution um, um, in terms of, uh, with respect to the panchromatic and the multispectral image that we have. Then we will have uh, M tilde, uh, which is a multispectral uh, image. So the, the original acquisition that we had from the sensor, that will be upscaled uh, because as you saw before, as we see here, uh, the scale so the, the spatial dimension of the multispectral is smaller than the, the panchromatic image. So usually this is one fourth of the spatial domain of the panchromatic. So there will be an operation uh, performing up, an upsampling, an upscaling, uh, without any, uh, any further processing of the original multispectral image in order to match the scale the, the spatial dimension of the, the panchromatic image, and then also the final result that we are looking for, so the point sharpened image. And then, uh, like our panchromatic image will be denoted by P, so this is the uh, just a scalar image. And uh, the, the idea is to try somehow uh, to extract some spatial details from this image here, some, so some spatial uh, features that are resolved by the panchromatic image, but they are not present in, in the original multispectral image. So basically, the, this general model that we we can see defined here uh, tell us that the result of punch sharp training for a given band k is equal to uh, basically the, the sum of an upsample version of the or the original multispectral image for the same band, uh, in which we add uh, the spatial details that are obtained from the panchromatic image with a, some injection gain, so, so with some some weights. So those uh, this term here, this coefficient, will weight uh, how much details we will like inject in the original multispectral image. So the, as I mentioned, like the effort that was done uh, with those two papers was to uh, try to cast, to, uh, to put all those different algorithms that have been proposed in the literature uh, and show that they all belong, they can be all represented by such a model. And in the following, we will see that the, the classical approaches can actually be divided into families. Uh, one family is called component substitution and the other family is called multi-resolution analysis. So for the first family, the uh, like what differs in, in, in those two is the way uh, we actually uh, estimate the spatial details from the panchromatic image and we will see that uh, different algorithms uh, will define like the spatial details in different ways and will define 
the injection gains in different ways as well. So the component sub substitution uh, will estimate the spatial details based on some information coming from the multispectral image. Whereas the multi-resolution analysis uh, will perform an estimation of the, the spatial details from the panchromatic image. So I will tell you a little bit more in here. Uh, so like if we take the component substitution family, uh, we can see that the spatial details coming from the panchromatic are obtained by uh, performing a subtraction of from the original panchromatic image. So, so this is the original band, the, the, the original ch panchromatic ch channel that was acquired by the satellite, where we subtract uh, this uh, IL. So this IL is actually an image, a monochromatic image, so a scalar image as well. So same, same, it will be defined in the same domain of the panchromatic. And this, uh, and this monochromatic image can be associated as a kind of an equivalent of the panchromatic image obtained by a linear combination of the spectral bands of the multispectral image. So you can see here that uh, this I, this I term, is given by the linear combination uh, of the original bands upsampled of the multispectral image with some coefficients. And we call uh, this family component substitution because, uh, uh, like historically, uh, those techniques were proposed in, in a, were following a procedure where uh, the uh, multispectral image was transformed into another representation space in which the idea was to uh, try to decouple the spatial information from the spectral information. So the spatial information, uh, meaning like that would be kind of a, a component uh, in the, in the transformed space where uh, the, the, that should match more or less the panchromatic image because as we mentioned before, panchromatic image will be uh, a broadband acquisition on the spectral domain. And the idea uh, in, those, uh, in those early representation of the component substitution analysis techniques uh, was to perform such a transformation, then identify the component that was uh, bearing the spatial uh, information, or let's say the component that should be close to the panchromatic, and then substitute the original panchromatic image to that component and uh, apply a uh, get back to the original space. So apply a reverse transformation in order to uh, spread the spatial, the higher spatial resolution uh, component that was substituted into the different channels of the multispectral image. And we, it is possible to prove that actually this uh, procedure is equivalent to the, the technique that we, to the, the formulation that is provided by this simple equation. So if we have a look to uh, like a more general view on the flowchart of these component substitution techniques, uh, we can see that we have several blocks. So this is kind of uh, like a representation showing uh, several uh, different uh, processes that we can that we can carry out. Uh, and basically, the the multispectral uh, information, uh, the, I mean the, the the multispectral bands after upsampling, uh, they will get combined. They will get combined by this linear transformation in order to have uh, an intensity image provided. And this intensity image will be subtracted to the panchromatic image that could be uh, matched uh, in terms of dynamics uh, with respect to the dynamics of the this linear combination of the multispectral bands. And that will show uh, basically the details that are present in the panchromatic image, but they are not resolved in this linear combination of the multispectral bands. And those details will get injected, they will get uh, added to uh, the original panchromatic image 
in order to have to provide a final um, a point sharpened image that we have here. So if we go now, uh, if we take into account the second family, which uh, is called the multi-resolution analysis, as I mentioned before, um, this is using exactly the same uh, the same formulation. The only problem, the only difference with respect to the uh, the component substitution uh, techniques are uh, is given by the way we define the the spatial details coming from the panchromatic that will be injected by this uh, additive scheme to the multispectral image. And in this case, uh, the, the spatial details are given by uh, the subtraction of the panchromatic image with a, a low pass uh, resolution version of the panchromatic image itself. So basically that will be a kind of a high pass filter. And this uh, PL, so a low pass version of the original panchromatic band is uh, obtained by performing, for example, a convolution of the panchromatic image with a given kernel, with a given mask, um, that will provide this, uh, that will blur, that will uh, reduce the, the spatial resolution, to, so the, the, the capability of, the, of this image to show uh, some fine details in the spatial domain. That should be, if you think, uh, uh, matched, it should be close to uh, the, the spatial resolution of the multispectral image. Because the idea is that panchromatic, so what we have here coming from the panchromatic image, uh, should contain all details that are not present in the multispectral image, but they are resolved in the original panchromatic image. And if we have a look to uh, the flowchart implementing the techniques belonging to this family, uh, we can see, uh, as we saw before, that we have like the multispectral image that will be then used for uh, as a base for the for the sharpening, and then from the panchromatic image itself, uh, we'll provide uh, we will generate a low pass version of it, and uh, by the subtraction of the uh, this uh, low pass version from the panchromatic, uh, we will obtain the spatial details that will get eventually injected in the multispectral image in order to generate a uh, high spatial and spectral resolution multispectral image, which is the punch sharpening product. So if we have a look to uh, now, uh, if we focus on the injection gains, so the, the coefficients that will weight somehow the spatial details that will get injected in uh, the multispectral bands. Uh, there as well, there, there are different uh, approaches that are proposed in the literature. So some of those uh, account for, um, for those injection weights as being scalars. So they will be the same. So they will be the same for, they will be the same for all pixels uh, in the same band. And some of those, some, some other techniques um, are actually defining the, this, uh, this spectral, uh, this uh, injection gains as being a pixel dependent. So we will have a single injection gain uh, that will be different, uh, possibly different for the, the different pixels that we have in the image and per band as well. So let's now present some examples of the um, of of the techniques uh, belonging to the two families, and we will see that how um, uh, recalling their definition as they, they were presenting uh, presented in the literature, it is possible to see as those uh, techniques all can be all casted in uh, uh, the the general formulation model that we proposed before. So perhaps the one of the simplest technique or one of also on, uh, of the earliest technique that was proposed because uh, you can see that uh, some of the examples of this technique was proposed in, in the 90s is based on uh, what is called a generalized intensity U and saturation uh, transformation. 
So the idea here is that uh, such a transformation that you might know um, that transform, like for example, a, an image, a color image defined in uh, in, in a RGB color space uh, into uh, another uh, another color space, which is uh, closer to the perception that we have. Uh, in terms of colors, in terms of uh, brightness, and so on, which is given by the so-called U saturation and intensity uh, color space. And in uh, in that color space, um, the the intensity component uh, contains uh, some information coming from the the brightness of the scene, which is kind of achromatic. So it doesn't depend on the different uh, characteristic spectral characteristics uh, related to the chromatic information that we can perceive as colors and this chromatic information will be contained in the hue and saturation channels so here the idea is uh, that in this component substitution um, let's say scheme uh, this transformation can lead to um, to components uh, that decouple the spatial and the spectral information coming from the image then what we can do uh, in this uh, in these settings is uh, that the intensity component of the in, uh, u saturation intensity model uh, should be close to the information that we have coming from the panchromatic so in this case uh, the those early uh, references proposed to perform such a transformation, then substitute the panchromatic image with the intensity component of the intensity hue and saturation model and get back to the original uh, RGB space. So the generalized intensity hue and saturation model basically extend, extends this idea uh, in order to be able to process images of more than three bands. So we have a kind of a generalized intensity U and saturation transform. And if we cast that in the general formulation model that we have, we will see that um, we will uh, we can define it in, in such a way where the injection gains uh, will be just one for all bands and they, they will apply uh, the same to all pixels. And the IL, so this uh, intensity component, which will be kind of the equivalent of the of a lower resolution version of the panchromatic, will be obtained just as a, the average uh, of the the different channels of the multispectral image. Another notable technique, uh, very well known in point sharpening, uh, was proposed is what we call the Provi transform. And that was proposed in uh, even before in the in eighty seven, and and that was proposed and presented uh, by uh, the by performing pan sharpening uh, using an injection scheme, uh, which was multiplicative. So its initial formulation is given by this equation, where we can see the pan the pan sharpened image is provided by uh, the ratio between the panchromatic and this intensity uh, channel. So that ratio will be uh, performed pixel wise. So every pixel in the panchromatic will be ratio will be divided by the value that we have in the intensity, this intensity channel here, uh, linear combination of the multispectral images uh, that we have in the corresponding pixels. And then we will have an Adamar product, so that will be a point-wise product as well, uh, with the original uh, multispectral image. And basically, this scheme can be recasted in uh, in the general formulation model that I mentioned before, where the injection uh, gains, so the the coefficients that we use, are provided by uh, such a ratio. So in this case, the injection, uh, the injection gains will be pixel dependent, and we will have different values 
for different bands. So this, uh, this scheme is actually uh, based on such a multiplicative uh, approach for defining the injection gains. And then we have several other uh, techniques that have been proposed in the literature. And uh, we're not going to detail uh, all, of, all of them, of course, but the, the main idea is that we, 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 we saw basically uh, different ways to define the, uh, the coefficients in the linear combination generating this intensity component uh, that should resemble the, the a low pass version, a lower resolution version of the panchromatic image. And the way uh, the, these uh, injection gains are, uh, are obtained. And basically, you can see that by taking um, that we have different uh, techniques that have been proposed. And some of those uh, start from fixing the gains and giving the same weight to all the bands, which is kind of a strong assumption. Still, uh, for some more recent techniques, uh, estimating uh, those gains, those, uh, sorry, those, those coefficients, uh, for example, by least squares. And those techniques usually uh, are the, those that perform the, the best in terms of accuracy because they can adapt to the data that we have. And then the injection gains, uh, again, we can see that uh, the early approaches were just fixing them um, in beforehand. So just taking one or like having them defined with respect to the data that we have. And in, uh, in more recent approaches, we can see that uh, those injection gains um, are dependent on like a, a kind of a measure of similarity between the intensity component that we have and the, uh, the spectral band that we want to uh, sharpen. And this, if you think, is kind of intuitive because uh, the idea is if we have a close match between, a uh, close correspondence between the intensity component, which is the, the low um, resolution version in this approximation of the panchromatic image and the multispectral band that we are processing, then it will be likely that the spatial details uh, that we see in the panchromatic image uh, should be present in that given band in, uh, in the multispectral image. So those injection gain will be kind of adaptive uh, with respect to the, uh, the similarity between bands and the a panchromatic image seen by this uh, intensity uh, channel, intensity image. So if we go now um, to, to present some techniques based uh, what, that, can be, um, that can be grouped in, uh, in the multi-resolution analysis family, as we, as we said before, the, the main difference with respect to the component substitution uh, techniques is that the panchromatic uh, image is uh, considered for generating the details. So those details will be uh, obtained by kind of a high pass filter or uh, in an equivalent fashion to perform the subtraction between the original panchromatic image and the low pass version of it, where this low pass, low pass version of the panchromatic image is obtained by like a convolution of the panchromatic with a given kernel. So there again, there are uh, several techniques that have been proposed. So the first uh, techniques uh, appear in, that appeared in the 90s were just considering a box filter. So that, that means that, uh, this kernel here is just taking the average over a neighborhood uh, for each pixel. And then uh, other techniques considered a Gaussian filter. Um, there again, we, we can find different uh, injection schemes. So like an, an additive injection that resemble uh, what we saw as well uh, with the generalized uh, EI, 
uh, HS and the uh, probate transform for the component substitution techniques. And the multiplicative injection where the, in this case, the injection gains are defined pixel wise and those are obtained for each pixel by the ratio between the value that we that we find in the multispectral uh, band that is that, that we are processing um, and the uh, panchromatic uh, the low pass version of the panchromatic image obtained by such a convolution and there are like a lot of different techniques as a, as i said that have been proposed and so we have all kind of variants in the way we can generate a low pass uh, version of the panchromatic image uh, which will be a lower spatial resolution uh, version of the panchromatic image and uh, so then we can use like a pyramidal decomposition uh, based on uh, gaussian uh, kernels or on wavelengths and uh, something which is uh, good to underline here is that uh, the if you think about like that process of uh, reducing the resolution of the panchromatic image well that should be performed in a way that the spatial resolution of the panchromatic image that we have at the end of the process uh, will match will be close to the uh, spatial resolution of the um, multispectral image and so that this processing uh, shows um, like uh, good results uh, when we consider the uh, some characteristics coming from the sensors, mainly uh, using like the point spread function of the multispectral sensor, or equivalently uh, the MTF, which is the modulation transfer function, which is just the uh, modulus, uh, the magnitude of the uh, Fourier transform of the point spread function. So this will tell us um, in the frequency domain um, how the spatial frequencies, the spatial uh, high and low frequencies that are present in the image will be transformed by, by this process here. And then as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, several different techniques that have been proposed and based on wavelets and one of the wavelet, mother wavelet that uh, proved to be uh, effective in, in by sharpening is the one that you see here that actually happened to be uh, very close to a Gaussian filter uh, where the uh, variance uh, or the characteristics of the, vari the, the, the Gaussian filter match the sensor MTF. So the, the point spread function finally of the, uh, the multispectral sensor. So we, as I said, uh, we can see different uh, variations of that general model that we detailed in the papers. And uh, in some cases, we see also some hybrid uh, techniques as in, in the case that you see here for the technique that is so-called AWLP where the details are computed by performing a difference between the panchromatic and the lupus version of the panchromatic itself so those will be uh, overall coming from the panchromatic image but the injection gains are uh, computed by considering the uh, intensity component obtained by as a linear combination of the bands of the multispectrum. So there are really uh, a lot of different algorithms that have been proposed and, uh, and th those papers that I mentioned before that I invite you to have a look to, uh, they will uh, detail like a general framework where, where we can cast all those algorithms. So in order to recall those main, uh, the characteristics of those two main families uh, for the component substitution, uh, the idea is that the, um, the details, the spatial details uh, coming from the panchromatic are obtained by as a difference between the panchromatic image and uh, a linear combination of the bands of the multispectral image. And for multi-resolution analysis, we will have like a difference between a panchromatic and a low-pass version of it. And once 
these uh, spatial details coming from the panchromatic are defined, it is possible to, with some appropriate uh, weights, to inject them to the multispectral bands in order to generate a pan-sharpened version of that uh, K-band in the multispectral image. So now uh, that I gave you an overview on those classical approaches in, in pan-sharpening, um, then we can apply those to the images. Uh, we will get different results. And the, the main problem that we will face is how do we uh, test the quality? How do we assess uh, the performances of those different algorithms with respect to the, uh, the images that are part, that are, have been sharpened? So quality assessment is usually done in point sharpening in two different ways. So the first and perhaps the simplest one to uh, uh, that we can put in place uh, is the so-called reduced scale validation. So it's a, a validation done in a at a reduced resolution. So the idea of this scheme is to perform um, a degradation of the resolution of both the panchromatic and the multispectral image and a subsampling. So in, in this case, we will have a copy of the panchromatic and the multispectral image that they were both um, reduced in, in terms of spatial resolution. And, and then we will process those uh, reduced resolution versions of the original panchromatic and multispectral image. In, uh, in this setting, uh, the, the underlying idea is that once we were able to perform punch sharpening over the, uh, this reduced uh, resolution multispectral image with the companion reduced resolution panchromatic image, we will have a punch sharpened uh, multispectral image, which should be as close as possible to the original multispectral image. So as you can imagine in this case, uh, by performing this uh, uh, reduced uh, scale validation, uh, applying this scheme of, uh, for performing a reduction of the resolution, it is possible to perform an analysis having a reference image that will be the original multispectral image. Another, uh, the, the second assessment procedure that we can find in, in, usually in the literature is the so-called full-scale validation. So in that case, uh, the idea is that we take the panchromatic and the multispectral images uh, at the their original resolution, so as they were acquired by, by the satellites, and we will perform uh, a validation of the pan-sharpening product uh, based on some indexes that uh, do not require any reference, which is kind of tricky because uh, then we, we need to inject somehow some a priori information on uh, what is in order to encode what is a good uh, result of this uh, punch sharpening product. So we if we take uh, the reduced scale resolution, then uh, as we have uh, an image, a reference image that we can uh, use for validation because that will be the original multispectral image. Then we can compute all sorts of uh, indexes that will, uh, that, that will show, that will uh, compute uh, a difference between, or a kind of a similarity, if you, want, if you like, between the result of the pan sharpening and the original multispectral image. And so we can find, for example, classical indexes like uh, the root mean square error. Um, that is the base of what we call ERGAS, so, uh, which is an acronym of error relative uh, global dimensional desynthese. And, uh, and the, also, for example, another classical uh, index that is used is the spectral angle mapper which is basically the angle between two vectors uh, after normalization. So this index here is uh, not sensitive to uh, differences uh, to scaling in, uh, in terms of intensity because we are normalizing this color product by the norm of the two vectors. 
And then we have other indexes that were proposed. So there as well, you, you will find uh, several different indexes that are proposed in the literature. And here you can see uh, three of those uh, that are based on, uh, let's say, kind of a structural similarity uh, between images. Uh, that is a similarity uh, accounting for both the average and the, the, the variance or covariance uh, usually computed on patches of the image. And so you can see this uh, uh, general Q index that have been uh, declined and uh, defined in, uh, in different ways according to the number of bands that we have. So like uh, Q4 is usually for four band uh, multispectral images. And then like that was uh, uh, generalized to an N number, uh, two to the power of N uh, number of bands. If we go uh, then, uh, if we account for uh, the full scale validation, uh, as I said before, we cannot use a reference image because in that case, uh, the ideal reference image will be the, uh, the, the quest the, the, of the, the of pan sharpening. And so uh, in this case, we, we can see that in the literature have been proposed uh, uh, indexes such as the QNR, so quality with no reference, where we have two main uh, uh, components one usually that estimates the spectral distortion and one that usually estimates the spatial distortion. And then we have other uh, that have been proposed, other, other variations. So now I would like to show some results on uh, some real images. So here uh, you, you can see um, a validation done by in a reduced resolution. Uh, because we will have the, as reference the original multispectral image. Then we have uh, the panchromatic and the multispectral images that will get fused in order to match this. Uh, that will be reduced in resolution. And I show you in this panel uh, the result uh, with respect to the reference image uh, by um, using several different techniques that are coming from like the component substitution family and the multi-resolution uh, family that you can see here. So it's not so um, clear how to see the, the differences in terms of uh, the images that are produced. So we can have a look to uh, a crop of that image. And you can see that with respect to the reference, uh, uh, some of the the uh, component substitution analysis uh, uh, techniques that are proposed um, show some kind of spectral distortion. So for example, here, that region is not rendered in a correct way. So the, the colors that are shown here, spectral variations are not so, so uh, like mm, consistent. And typically, uh, what we see in the multi-resolution analysis is that the, the spectral distortion is lower, but, but actually the spatial details are not so rendered uh, well as in that case. And this is also proven by the indexes, uh, the, Q, the spectral angle, and the, uh, this error based on the root mean square error. If we go on, uh, on an example on a full resolution uh, analysis, uh, in that case, we will just have those two images. So the panchromatic and the multispectral. The multispectral could get upsampled to match the scale of the panchromatic. And there again, uh, I will show you uh, here some results uh, of the techniques that I mentioned before. So in this case, uh, we, we can also spot that there are some distortions between uh, uh, like some spectral variations in the family uh, of the component substitution. And typically what we see is uh, like some, the, the rendering of the spatial details is not so well done in the multi-resolution analysis techniques, which is clear if we take a zoom on the, uh, on the different uh, on the different images that I've shown before. 
there are, again, uh, we typically use uh, indexes that require no quality in order to perform a quantitative analysis. And uh, this QNR will combine the information coming from a spectral index and a spatial index. And it is possible to see uh, as typically the, uh, we have not so good results in terms of a spectral index for the uh, component substitution analysis techniques and for the multi-resolution analysis, then the, the problem usually comes from the rendering of the spatial details. So to conclude on, on, on this part, uh, I, I shown some um, techniques uh, and that are belonging to the component substitution and multi-spectral resolution analysis. And they are performing uh, in different ways with respect to the point sharpening problem. And I, as I mentioned before, like usually component substitution analysis are uh, good to are robust to uh, problems related to misregistration to uh, between the panchromatic and the multispectral bands. Uh, but they are affected typically by spectral distortion. And this uh, robustness in terms of the spatial domain is usually shown by having a higher quality uh, resolution in the, spec in the spatial details. Multi-resolution multi analysis techniques uh, usually have the converse uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of features and they provide uh, a good analysis uh, uh, of the um, a good rendering of the spectral information, but they are they are typically providing poor results, poorer results in terms of uh, the uh, spatial details that are rendered in the image. So now I would like to uh, end this presentation by providing some perspectives uh, and some, let's say, an overview on uh, recent trends that we can see in the point sharpening community. So um, starting stemming from these classical techniques, uh, we can see that there are some the so-called third generation power sharpening methods that have been uh, uh, gathering attention and, and getting uh, more and more contributions. And those are usually uh, given or provided by, uh, by considering some uh, the, the formation model uh, of those panchromatic and multispectral images in order to cast the problem of pan sharpening as a variational problem. So like an, optimi an optimization problem. Some of those are also uh, considering some uh, uh, sparse representation uh, approaches in order to perform uh, the pan sharpening problem. And recently like a, a, a neural network based uh, approaches have been proposed and usually um, taking into account uh, convolutional neural networks or like a generative models as well. So just to give you some details on uh, the uh, variational methods, the, the main idea is to uh, uh, base the analysis on a multispectral model that will rely uh, the multispectral acquisition with respect to the unknown uh, higher spatial and spectral resolution multispectral band, which is bands, uh, that is the, the quest, the, the goal of pan sharpening, that will be uh, a subsampled and blurred version uh, of the this high higher spatial resolution and, uh, and spectral resolution uh, multispectral image. Um, that will generate uh, our acquisition, our multispectral acquisition. And then the panchromatic model, it will be kind of equivalent where we can assume that the panchromatic band is obtained by a linear combination of the bands in the multispectral, in, in this high unknown uh, multispectral image. And typically what we uh, are doing in those techniques is to cast the problem, the pan sharpening problem as uh, in a variational framework where we define a cost function that should be minimized. So usually we have a, a data term and typically a regularization because this problem is, is ill posed. So we will have solutions that are not robust or they, they might not even exist or being unique. 
And uh, just an example, a relevant example, uh, here you can see a super resolution uh, functional that is uh, performing a sharpening uh, ac according to the, the model of a multispectral uh, image and the panchromatic image using some spatial regularization. So those are like some ongoing works uh, that are promising um, uh, providing um, information, uh, providing results that are usually uh, getting better than the classical approaches that have been proposed. So another um, another um, like family of methods that we that we saw uh, appearing uh, in the recent years is based on uh, on convolutional neural networks, and the idea is uh, there to learn an end-to-end model. Uh, so performing a reduce by reducing the resolution of the panchromatic and the multispectral image, and and learning uh, a way to super resolve uh, both panchrom a panchromatic and the multispectral image in order to generate a higher spatial and spectral resolution uh, image that will be the result of the pan sharpening. So those are getting uh, developed. Uh, currently, and so they they can they gather a lot of attention. And in terms of uh, again of perspectives, we we see uh, some several uh, new axes that stem from the regular uh, fusion of pan sharp, uh, panchromatic, and a multispectral image. Uh, where, for example, uh, we uh, we perform like uh, a sharpening of an hyperspectral image using a panchromatic image, and this is uh, some some scheme gathering a lot of attention in these days because we have um, some platforms that will some new satellite missions like Prisma that has been uh, has been recently launched. Uh, that acquires uh, an hyperspectral image and a panchromatic one. So the idea is how do we perform such a fusion? And other uh, alternative fusion schemes uh, account for the fusion between a multispectral and, a, and uh, for example, a hyperspectral or like multispectral images acquired by different satellites, so from different platforms. Okay, so this concludes uh, the, the talk and uh, I would like to just underline that if you'd like to uh, perform uh, yourself some test on a punch sharpening um, we uh, I, I can uh, underline I can propose uh, to uh, to go and uh, to those links where you can find some toolbox uh, uh, containing MATLAB, MATLAB functions of the different techniques that I've been mentioning in uh, in the talk. Okay, so this is it, and I would like to thank you for the your attention. And uh, if you have any question, I would be really happy to, to reply. Thank you, Mauro. A uh, very enlightening uh, presentation. I think especially the fact that you presented all these techniques under the same work frame is especially interesting. Um, you were mentioning like these techniques as being 30 plus years old. Um, just a short comment. I started my master's in 86 with what was at the time the first spot one image acquired over Canada. And to me, this is when this all this pan sharpening business started with spot one because we had you know a 10 meter image and, and but there was a fundamental problem the, is that we had spot one I had only I had no blue band, I had only a, a green, a red and an infrared. And for the infrared, the, the sharpening didn't work as well, you know, because uh, the, the, the correlation, you know, well, the overlap between the, the panchromatic band and the infrared is almost nil. And it was in, in, the, uh, in the first uh, one, uh, satellite. Um, another, I think, interesting fact that uh, I thought I figured you were going to mention, but, but 
um, it's that nature actually uses the same trick, you know, by fusing. Our brain is fusing information from the cones of our eyes and the rods to artificially increase, you know, the sharpness of, of our vision. Um, I'd like to make myself the, the, the devil's advocate a bit, um, saying that th there are fundamental flaws in, in any uh, pen sharpening uh, technique. And I'd like you to comment a bit on these flaws, you know, see it from this angle instead of the, uh, of the, act, the advantages again, uh, you know, so just to look at the disadvantages. Okay, so th thanks uh, for for the uh, sharing. I mean, in your experience, so that is uh, dating back to even earlier than uh, the reference, the earliest reference that I put, that was eighty-seven, I think. So, <laughs> Don't so, I have to make a dinosaur or something. <laughs> That's okay. No, uh, we say pioneer. <laughs> okay. So, so thanks for that, and, um, and thanks for the question. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, I mean, uh, the uh, as I mentioned, the problem of punch sharpening is uh, is ill posed by nature, and uh, the result of punch sharpening is could let's say look good in, from a perceptual point of view, but if we use uh, a punch sharpen image for like remote sensing in a quantitative way. So as a metric product, uh, in that case, uh, yeah, we should do it with care because uh, the, we, we, I would like to underline that uh, uh, pan sharpening will generate a synthetic image. So an image that was not existing. So something that uh, has not been acquired by, um, by, by those sensors. And, uh, and there are several uh, pitfalls in, uh, in the different techniques that we can apply. Uh, for example, as I mentioned, uh, usually we have the, that the panchromatic can be, can be associated to a linear combination of the bands of the multispectral image. And as you said, if the spectral response of the panchromatic does not match the uh, spectral responses of the multispectral channels, because maybe some of the channels uh, were acquired uh, in an interval of the um, of the spectral domain that is outside the uh, the sensitivity of the of the panchromatic band. Then, in that case, uh, we we could inject uh, some spatial details that are are not perhaps present uh, in reality in that band. So that could be a risky uh, uh, process because then we generate an image that is uh, that, you know, where we, we, we just mm, you know, added some artificial details that are, might look good, but they, they might not be meaningful from a spectral point of view. And something else that I, um, that I saw uh, from experience uh, by, by looking at all those different techniques is that uh, some of those techniques are coming from some heuristics or some first uh, principles uh, that have been then formulated uh, deriving, uh, let's say, a final algorithm for performing pan sharpening. Uh, but those first principle uh, basic facts uh, come also from uh, some interpretation of the data that we have. So, so sometimes, uh, uh, yeah, we, we perform like such a sharpening, but I think uh, we should be careful with the results that we have. And this is even more true if oh, we, uh, yeah, sorry, just, just to, to finish. Oh, sorry. No, no, okay. I'm just going to say, I'm glad to hear you say that because I've been saying that to my students for, uh, 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 to be very careful about that. Because your traction is there, you know, you see, you see the two images, you tend to think, well, it's, it looks better, but, but you have to think the, the loss of data as well. So I'm sorry, you, you, if you wanted to keep going. Yeah, no, just to, just to recall that, um, like, data-driven techniques uh, that are gaining a lot of attention in those days, 
can provide um, also like very good results but in those cases uh, the the spatial details uh, might even i mean we might even have lower control on the spatial details that are have been uh, have been produced because uh, those techniques like uh, guns for based for example or also cnn uh, they are like ast providing astonishing results, but in some cases it's not um, possible to inspect in details uh, the, the way they process the data and then like you know, we don't have uh, so much control on the results. Um, I'm not sure, is there other question from the audience from Jefferson? Sure. Uh, let's see. Laura, do, do you want to see? Uh, do you want to? Can you please uh, read for us? Um, okay, ah, uh, great. Oh, Laura, I'm oh, sorry. Okay, oh, you can talk. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't get that. It's a question from Jose Marcato Jr. A great talk, Mauro. How can we deal with positional deviation between PAN and MC images? Okay, so thanks, Jose, uh, for, for the question. So this is uh, indeed like a, a problem, like we might have co-registration co issues between the panchromatic and the multispectral channels because they are, yes, acquired by the same platform, uh, but then like they might be acquired with uh, some lag uh, some temporal delay and, uh, and and also like in some nasty cases we can if there are moving objects like a plane uh, flying uh, in the sky then in that case we will see kind of a ghost images of uh, of the object in the different channels so the the problem of co-registration uh, in first approximation is not so uh, so much of a problem as if we were uh, dealing with the fusion between uh, images acquired by different platforms, but it is indeed present. So if we take into account the, um, the classical approaches, uh, usually like the component substitution ones, uh, as they perform um, a, 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 like an extraction of the spatial details coming from the, just the subtraction uh, of the panchromatic, uh, and the, the difference be between a panchromatic image and a linear combination of the bands uh, coming from the multispectral, they, in a way, uh, account already for this uh, for this misalignment between the uh, panchromatic and the uh, and the multispectral image. So, in, in cases where this is uh, is a problem, then it would be better to use such a, of techniques in in the classical framework. Let's say. So I hope it replies to the question. Um, I'd like to have, because it has something to do with the, the same question. I saw one of the papers you co-authored that you actually, uh, I don't remember the, the first author, but you actually took 60 meter data from Sentinel-2 and brought it down to 10 meters. and. It, there, the problem of location becomes even stronger. You have to find uh, a 10 pixel, a 10 meter pixel in a 60 by 60 meter pixels. Um, if you can just comment on that study, uh, or I think it was from this year or, or last year, something. Yeah. Uh, so, in, in uh, if we take into account uh, Sentinel two. Uh, there, the, I, I think the main interest is between the is in the fusion between 10 meter and 20 meter bands because they they all sense uh, uh, mainly land surface. Uh, if we take the 60 meter bands, uh, in that case, as the three bands of 60 meters coming from Sentinel, um, they are designed for mainly uh, atmospheric correction. So I think. It, is, yeah, usually it's not. It's more of an exercise, I, I guess, uh, taking them into account in the fusion than like uh, to the real uh, gain that they can provide 
in, uh, in the fusion itself because uh, those bands are mainly for atmospheric correction. So they, they will see clouds or uh, uh, water vapor in, in, uh, in the channel. But this is, uh, I mean, your remark is, uh, is valuable because uh, in some cases, um, like pan sharpening has some constraints, has some limitations. We cannot like fuse uh, 1000 meter uh, band with like a 10 meter bands because uh, there might be uh, there is so so much ambiguity that is not making the the process possible and so perhaps like the 60 meter bands can be helpful in kind of constraining overall uh, you know the consistency the consistency of the results uh, but then uh, saying that we are able to uh, precisely uh, estimate the the spatial details at 60 meters from uh, 10 meters then is uh, is a very challenging problem like you said it, it was a good exercise but but maybe not so practical in, in, in times okay uh, Jefferson if you have another question or Laura yeah, I have a question, but uh, first of all, uh, I would like to to pass my word to Laura. Uh, I will Thanks. keep my, my my question for the, the last time. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, thank you very much, Mauro. Great talk. I learned. Uh, my area of research is deep learning applied to remote sensing image analysis. And for that reason, I would like to know what could be the limitations of using deep learning when compared, for example, with these classical methods. Sometime, sometimes we want to use deep learning for everything, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not always the best uh, options. Uh, and then I would like to, to know to you, for you, your consideration about these uh, limitations that we can face in part championing with, with, with deep learning. So, um, in, in this case, uh, deep learning techniques uh, have proven to, uh, to provide uh, extremely uh, good results. And uh, so, so the talk was more like, let's say, an overview on the classical techniques uh, just to, to set a framework. Um, but um, there are several examples where like CNN and recently like GANs uh, provide uh, very good results. Um, one of the main limitations that mm, I, I would say they have from a practical point of view is the computational complexity uh, because the, the classical techniques are, you know, blazing fast. They are, they are you know, just a few lines of code and uh, the, you can processly process uh, right away like very large images. And uh, if we take the um, uh, like another limitation that they might have uh, deep learning approaches is that the main scheme, uh, as far as I know, that is used for learning is end-to-end uh, uh, -end learning. So we reduce the, the, the resolution and we try to get back to the original images. And this, in general, is kind of a sensor dependent because if we uh, have like a prediction model that has, or like a, a deep learning model for performing pan sharpening that it has been learned, uh, usually like it, it focuses on, uh, on, uh, on a given uh, uh, set of images coming from a sensor. So if we process like four band images, then that model might not work on eight band uh, image. So uh, th there could be some problems related to uh, like transfer learning going from like a learned model on, uh, on a set of images to another one. Whereas like classical techniques can are, you know, are so simple that they can be easily deployed on, uh, on, uh, on, on different sensors. And I, I personally, I, I think the, you know, the, there's a, uh, very promising uh, research topics that are related to joining uh, or getting hybrid hybrid schemes based on data uh, driven techniques like uh, deep learning approaches and also considering uh, as kind of prior knowledge 
the, um, the, the results that could be given by classical techniques as well. Yes, uh, I was yeah. thinking about the robustness of classical models could be better than deep learning models. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, my question is quite related to, to this. And uh, uh, did you see the, the, those methods that uh, perform super resolution, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, uh, when I see this kind of uh, approach, I, 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 I usually relate this with pan sharpening. What do you, do you think about it? It's possible to benefit from uh, super resolution methods to solve or, or to improve uh, pan sharpening approaches? Yes, definitely, because uh, we could think of uh, like pan sharpening as uh, a simpler problem uh, with respect to uh, the the super resolution, um, you know, uh, super the classical super resolution that we could apply, because uh, uh, in uh, super resolution we have no reference, no guiding uh, like information that could come from a higher uh, spatial resolution version of the the image that we want to estimate and uh, in that case uh, i mean having at our disposal a panchromatic band can be really beneficial because it will guide uh, the, the the super resolution process on the multispectral images then the the, the question is like uh, how can we exploit um, this information as it is not directly re related to doesn't match uh, in a straightforward way uh, to the higher spatial resolution uh, multispectral image that we want to estimate. So th that is, I think, uh, like, yes, definitely, we should use that in order to perform super resolution. Uh, so it could be an improvement to classical super resolution problems. And then the open question would be, like, how do we put them together, uh, which could be what Laura also joining what Laura mentioned uh, before, like that by designing some deep learning techniques, uh, then we can have like this freedom in uh, in putting together the information coming from the monochromatic and the multispectral images. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so, oh, Philip, uh, what do you think? We we are quite quite uh, finishing our session, but uh, we have time for one question from the audience. What do you think? Um, well, I had something uh, I'd like to run by Mauro. It's just an idea that okay. I was thinking of. I'm no specialist of pen sharpening, but imagine we've been using with high resolution image or very high resolution image, the segmentation uh, in, you know, inserting segmentation before classification. So you separate the objects. How, how about uh, performing pen sharpening only on edge pixels after maybe a segmentation? I don't know if this has been done or tried, you know, so that you, you preserve the information within the objects, but then you use pen sharpening to only, only on the edge Pixels and, and this came from from a project I had. We we use Sentinel One images, real images to extract the contour of small lakes, and, uh -huh. and we measured, we quantified the, the proportion of water and and ground within the edge pixels. And so I, I was thinking something like that. What what, what is your feeling? Or it maybe has been done. I, I'm not. I don't know. Um, I, I think it, it could be a good approach because, uh, uh, you know, the regular uh, conventional pan sharpening uh, approaches are kind of unsupervised by definition. Like the, the goal is to generate a super resolved image, uh, but the, this, is, this process is not optimized with respect to a given final application. So if the final application is to perform some land cover analysis uh, or land use uh, analysis in order to detect some, some specific classes or objects, 
then um, there could be def definitely uh, the possibility to uh, embed this information in the process. And this, inf this, um, this could be done, as you said, by uh, performing kind of a segmentation on the image. And we, um, we worked a little bit on that. And we, in order to estimate the injection gains based on uh, some segments, so the idea was to segment the image and uh, estimate uh, a, like a coefficient that was weighting the different uh, details that were injected in an image. That was uh, based on uh, like a segmentation. So each segment in the segmentation map was using the same, the same injection gain. And that was a way to uh, perform the, the process in an adaptive way with respect to the spatial content of the image. But this could be definitely go uh, further away. If, if, for example, you'd like to process mainly vegetation, and then, uh, as you mentioned before, perhaps uh, you know, blue bands or like a green bands are not so well rendered because they, um, perhaps due to some mismatches with the panchromatic spectral response. And, and then uh, by detecting uh, those areas beforehand, uh, could be a way to perform uh, in an adaptive way uh, the part sharpening process. So in order to enhance uh, some some specific bands that could be uh, that we could know a priori that they are more important for generating uh, that kind of land cover. But well, my, well might be an idea <laughs> to test something to test. Okay, thank you, Mauro. Okay, thanks. Jefferson? So, one more question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. Hi, thanks for the presentation. What is the effect of the size of the test area in the point sharpening performance? Um, I would say uh, that is quite limited in a way that uh, the techniques that are applied uh, perform a local anal analysis. So the, um, let's say the, the, the gains uh, or the, 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 the way the multispectral and the panchromatic image are put together uh, is usually dependent on like a close neighborhood of each pixel. Uh, the, uh, like a stronger effect could be done if we consider very large areas. Uh, if some of the assumptions that we are taking so far are not true, for example, the fact that um, the, the point spread function of the multispectral band is a translation invariant. So it will be exactly the same in all parts of the image. But if we take a small crop of the image, this is this can be seen as a in first approximation uh, as a property that holds. But if we uh, consider a very large area, uh, in that case, we might experience that it, uh, the the blur, so the the, the point spread function will var vary with respect to the different part of the image, and this is not intrinsically taken into account, but it, by the techniques that I mentioned. So it should be uh, something to, uh, yeah, to, to consider. But I would say in first approximation, perhaps uh, this is not so, uh, it doesn't give so, so much of an impact, but this is something to take into account if we are going deeper in the models that we consider for performing different sharpening. Oh, thank you. So uh, I believe we 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 are done. I believe it, it, it's all of uh, wonderful in this in this session. So thank you, Mauro. I would like to thank also Philippe Maillard for the, the partnership here, and also Laura. Thank you, thank you, Mauro. So okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jefferson. Thanks, Philippe. Thanks, Laura, for chairing the session and uh, to all the organizers and uh, the audience that uh, followed. And, uh, you're in, you're in Grenoble, is it? Yes. You're in Grenoble? Okay. I used to, I, I went 
I, I go to Saint Hilaire a lot. Near, you went to? Ah, okay, okay. I to, go to Saint Hilaire. I do, I do hang gliding. <laughs> hang gliding. Paragliding. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so. so give me a call when, next time that you come. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Okay, so, so uh, good luck to you. Thank the audience also. And see you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank Thanks. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Jefferson.